Um, I do not have to use a script to introduce you, but those who do not know David, David has been here for quite a long time and we happen to work in almost the same field. David is an entrepreneur and he is very knowledgeable and um, quite, uh, what can I call it? Um, I want to use my own words to describe you. He does his research and he uses it to create exciting experiences. Recently, David um, started focusing on um, Tripesa that he'll be telling us about. And he used insights from the projects that he had done in the past, uh, engaging with investors, using customer insights, and also relating that to the opportunities that are in Uganda to create a product that actually does deliver value. David is going to speak to us about um, attracting investors or attracting investment, which is really a journey to growing our businesses. David, you're welcome. It's the Business Recovery Series with Enterprise Uganda. On the call, we have local business owners, small to medium uh, business owners. Um, we are in a space where we, okay, we, we meet here every Thursday, and we talk about our businesses. Um, we get knowledge from experts like you. And now towards the end of this year, we have about four months to go. A discussion like this about attracting investors is very crucial because when I think about all the stuff that we, we've discussed this year, this one has come just at the right time. So David, I'm going to invite you to introduce yourself. <coughs> give us your presentation. Great, thank you very much, Belinda. I hope you can hear me clearly. I can hear you and I can see you. Perfect. So uh, my name is David Bonahasa. I have been, uh, yesterday was my 40th birthday, so I'm pretty excited oh, about that. Happy birthday, um, David. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, of that time, I think for about 21 years, so beginning at 19, I began trying to build businesses. And I've been through the cycle of trying to raise money, failing to raise money, closing companies reopening and restarting for quite some time um, and I've always found that raising money is one of the most fundamental things to making a business work because the second you're out of cash the business is most probably dead um, I built a company called uh, Round Bob maybe some of you saw it it was an online uh, travel business uh, I also helped build a company called MCash maybe some of you know it and have used it and right now I'm on my, uh, I think, fifth or sixth company trying to build. It's called Tripesa. Tripesa is uh, a solution for the tourism sector. What we do is try to eliminate the technology challenges that small businesses have. As a small company in tourism, you could be a hotel, a restaurant. We call it tourism and experiences, really. You could be a hotel, a restaurant, an events provider. Um, a tour operator, one of the things you need is a good technology to help you sell, uh, basically allow people to find you, allow people to pay you, allow people to book with you. These technologies normally cost a lot of money and what we've done is build technology that builds that for you and takes away the cost of doing it yourself or of, do, of doing it through through uh, expensive third parties. So it costs you $180 that will give you a website with payments, with bookings management, with marketing and distribution. And we've done this for the last uh, two years. We've raised close to $600,000 for that business. And this is through a number of investors. It's uh, active in Kenya and Uganda. And it is a very, very interesting journey. Um, so I'm here to share with you about fundraising. Belinda says the word, use the word, um, expert. I do not like to think of myself as an expert. I've just been fortunate to have experiences that, you know, um, many people can learn from because I can tell you raising money is one of the hardest things uh, because unfortunately, many times we get many things wrong. Many times we sort of think that raising money is a science and there's a structured way to it. But when you're a small business, actually raising money is, is more of an art uh, because I like to make the joke uh, you know, in Uganda, we always complain about uh, guys finding girlfriends and giving them so much money. Right? 
sometimes the amount of money you're raising as a business, the reason they do that is because they like the person. And the funny thing about raising money is that many times as an early stage business, it comes down to how much uh, you are likable. And that is the that is the most shocking thing I learned over the years. However, <clears throat> there's you know many things to it. So I, I, over the next couple of minutes, I'm happy to be sharing this with you, and I hope that it it can be um, impactful um, in your business. We shall go through two sections of this presentation. The first is on fundraising, and the next is on pitching for fund for funding. Because I think one of the most core things about raising money is being able to actually sell yourself and sell your business. And I think many times we forget that. Uh, but also many times as business owners, we forget that because we are entitled. You know, you think because you have this nice little idea, someone, you know, should listen to you, someone should give you money. And I like to start here because in truth, no one really cares about you and no one owes you anything, right? The only reason why people want to give you their money is because they're attracted to the value that you create in the world. So the biggest question you must ask yourself constantly as you you know you struggle and you hustle and you do this thing is am I creating value is it worthwhile for anyone does it make sense one of the saddest things I always hear is when entrepreneurs start saying things like oh you're my friends but you don't buy from me no they don't buy from you know, because they don't want to but they just don't see the value so they would rather buy from someone who gives you value and I like to equate this to this Chinatown story Chinatown came in and is taking everyone's money and the traders are complaining. But what Chinatown is doing is giving value to the end consumer, right? And that's, it's the same thing about life, the same thing about investment, you know? So between you and I as a consumer, I don't care about people. I care about, am I getting my product? Does my product make sense? Is it priced, is it priced properly? And I think that's the thing that as entrepreneurs, we should be really looking at. But also I want to, to uh, just reassure you that it is hard all around. You know, so many times you have this very clear plan that I'm going to start the business and go from one point to the end. But in reality, um, it's very difficult. There's all these pits, valley of death, so many places you can die. But how you raise money is, you know, is where great entrepreneurs thrive because you're able to find or navigate ways around <clears throat> um, all these challenges. I mean, I could share very many stories about struggling with fundraising, but I'll share one very recent one that's happening to us. We closed uh, an investment from uh, one of the big institutions and you sign a contract and three months later, they haven't you know, dispersed the money because fundraising ends when the money is in the bank. Uh, and these are all things that, again, you learn over time. You know, We've had scenarios where you raise money from bad investors. They promise to give you money, but the money doesn't come or they give you bits and pieces so the business fails. So yeah, this, these challenges are normal and in business, you know, as opposed to feeling sorry for yourself, it's best for you to find um, how, how you can move forward. But let's get into it. Um, how do you find us a company? And, and these are, you know, the saddest thing I find sometimes is entrepreneurs who don't actually understand the language of investment and fundraising. Um, because when you walk into a room with a great idea, someone also wants to know that you have the knowledge of money, the knowledge of, of raising. And, you know, I've had conversations from some people who say, yeah, this fundraising people especially uh, only works for technology people and they have these statements, you know, you need to learn these things, right? So since we all know that raising money is hard, the first hard way to raise money is debt. Uh, debt, we all know what debt is, you go to the bank. The other hard way is uh, equity. So equity where it basically means you give off some of your business to an investor. The third one is something called grants. Uh, again, very few options exist. I'm sure Belinda and the team at Enterprise Uganda have given you some grants. And the last one, which is really, really difficult, is bootstrapping. You know this thing where people say it's my baby and I have to protect it and keep my company to myself? Yeah, you struggle through the process uh, of being able to build the business. So all these are, are options of how to raise money. And just to sort of go over them a little bit more, debt, uh, debt, as you all know, is when you go to a bank, um, a money lender, a loan shark, a whatever it is to borrow money because your business needs some money. The good thing about debt is that you don't lose ownership. You know, this thing that we like to say that, oh, my baby, I don't want, to, I don't want you know, to have people in my business. I don't work, you know, because also partners are difficult. And, and we'll come to that in the next slide. But, you know, when, when you raise money from someone and they come in as part of your business, it can be very difficult. It's like a marriage. You're, you're happy in the day the money comes in, the day you open the company, 
But unfortunately, as you start to work together, you start to have conflict and it can be difficult. So the good thing about borrowing money is that you do not lose any ownership. You still maintain your entire operation. Second thing is that debt will give you a way to maintain your operation. So you can still run the business and it's going pretty well. The bad thing about debt is that you have a fixed monthly payment. One of the things about business is really if you can avoid fixed costs, that's that's one of the best things you can do for yourself because you must pay this money on time. Two is that, you know, it may be collateralized. So you've basically used your house, you've used your car, you've used your land, you've used whatever it is to borrow this money, which means if you fail to pay it back, you will probably lose your asset and probably at a much lower cost. We all know what's happening with their center and all these things. Really, he says it's 120 billion shillings, but the bank is saying we want 10.5 and the bank is not going to sell and give you your balance, unfortunately, right? Um, the third thing is lenders, lenders don't care about your business. You know, it's funny. I don't know if you've realized this. When you start to have good cash flows, the bank will call you and tell you, oh, we can give you this loan, right? The reason why they do that is not because they care about your business. They care about how much money they can make from you and from your cash flows. So they are watching your business well enough. And it's a very smart strategy. So that's a bad thing because all they care about is your repayment. So if you fail to pay, the bank will change. Have you ever noticed how um, when you initially borrow money, everyone is smiling in the bank? And then when they fail to pay, the person calling you has the worst attitude in the world. That's what happens because they need to collect their money back. It's their business. And lastly, you only get access to debt financing when you don't need it. When the business is doing well, then they want to lend you money. So, so you need to appreciate debt. But debt, debt is a really good instrument of raising money because it can help you fill gaps. You know, When you borrow money at the right time because um, you have uh, you know, a, a transaction happening and you need to fill it, these are good ways to, to use debt. So don't fear debt. Debt is good. Just understand what the, the, the repercussions could be. The next is equity. <clears throat> and equity in this case is when, you know, you go to someone and say, I will give you a piece of my business for your investment. So say, for example, if you give me uh, 100 million shillings as an investment to my business, I will give you 10% or 20%. So typically this is based on things like a valuation. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that a little bit later. Um, and the valuation can be based either on uh, your sales, your revenue, and someone will calculate your revenue times maybe three or four or five to get to what the valuation of your business is. It can be based on future projections. So what can my business grow into? Uh, it can be based on another similar company that grew very big. Okay. So the good thing about equities, there's no monthly payments. In some cases, you can raise a lot of, of, of money. So um, I think you've seen uh, some companies telling you they've raised $5 million, new companies, very young businesses, a few months in and they've raised $5 million. This happens in the equity markets and it's normally based on, um, on, on projected valuations. Um, if you get the right investor, they won't only give you money, they will also give you support, they will give you access to their network because they're also invested with you. They are now part of the business. And the last thing is that many investors look at a long term. So it's not, I want my money next week. No, it is, I'm going to give you my money and we'll come back in. We look at it in three years, five years to negotiate it. The problem with equity is that you lose ownership. It's no longer your business, no longer your baby, as you like to call it, which means that they can fire you. I have been in a way fired from a business that I started. So it is possible to actually happen to you. You report to a board. You, you don't have autonomy on decisions. And the last thing is that many investors come into a business to exit. They don't come in for dividends. And this is something that we need to understand. If I give you my money today, I want my money to turn into uh, so many times. Because you see, I'm counting that if I put my money in the bank, the bank will give me 10% per year. So if I give my money to you, I should know that over the next five years, I should make more than 50% of my money in terms of, of, of the accrual, okay? So in that case, what basically happens is that I want to know that I can make, you know, two, five times my money. So I, I want, the only way you do that is by selling the business. So either you have to buy them out at some point or they get money from somebody else to come in. There's different types of equity investors, venture capital, which normally comes in very early, uh, private equity, which comes in later when the company is already working. And then you have, of course, what you call angel investors. Uh, 
the, the next is grants. And I think we've all seen grants. Grants is free money. That's what it is. You just have to report. That's the problem. There's no monthly repayment. There's no lot of loss of ownership. There are many sources of grants in some cases. The problem with grants is that sometimes only few people can get the grants. So you have a lot of competition for these grants. Uh, they're very specific, you know, so the grant will be for women in coffee. So if you're doing, if you're a man doing cocoa, there's no grant for you. They can be very time consuming. The process of application, I've got a few grants before, but it's so time consuming. Then you have so much time you have to start, you know, doing reporting. Then they'll tell you, oh, now you have to come to this conference and the other event and you have to, so it's just, and it's just too much going on. Also the amounts they give many times grants are small and not sufficient for your business. But lastly, grants can take focus away from your business. So you spend so much time trying to get grants, 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 grants. And it just, you know, think about free money sometimes you don't do very much with it. But grants are good. I mean, all these things are good instruments that you can use. You just have to know what works for me when. The next is bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is when you hustle, as they call it. You don't lose ownership, you retain autonomy, but it's very difficult. And the thing about bootstrapping, for some of you, I'm sure, who are running, who are running your businesses, it, it can threaten your domestic affairs because you're stressed all the time. You're just struggling to do the business. The next is it's hard to attract good talent. You know, human resource, human capital is one of the most important things for a business. When people know that you've raised money, they want to work with you. When they know that you're struggling, they feel like, ah, I don't want to work with that family business because, you know, it, everything is about the guy who started it. Okay? The last thing is that you lose focus on, you can lose focus because now you start being tactical as a business. You, let's say you're, you're running a business in coffee. Then someone says, ha, there's a money, in some, there's a deal here for us to go and buy equipment to sell in Congo. You might actually move your money and do things like that. And that's because you need to make money to keep it going. So all these things are good, okay? All of them are good. The thing about it is you just have to know what is the type or what is the way you want to raise money uh, at a particular point, okay? And that's that's just it. Uh, there are things to consider is you need to pick your investors carefully because investors can be such a disaster. I have, I've shared a few stories. I have raised money from investors who committed money they give you a small deposit, then they begin to give you small amounts of money. It will never grow your business. I've had investors who make, you know, don't disburse money on time. I've had all sorts of investors uh, in my experience. And I can tell you the best investors come in with more than money. So what do you consider? One is the stage. At what stage are you? How early are you? Okay. If you're a very young business, uh, be very careful about who you bring in because they might take larger chunks of your business. Um, if you're a bigger business, I, I, I don't know if you've heard about, and I'm not sure if I should share this story, but there's a pharmacy, a pharmacy company that was sold recently in this country. And the investors came into this business, made an investment, and they began to take control from the owner of the business. And at some point, they said, I want to sell it. Right? So you need to be very careful of, around who you get in. Geographical target. Don't waste your time invest, talking to investors who don't invest in your country or in your region. You know, when someone comes, one of the saddest things I keep seeing is as entrepreneurs, when we run to investors and we're so excited to quickly share with them, oh, my name is so-and-so, this is my business, oh, I need, first ask them, where do you invest? How much do you invest? You know, because the business is yours. And the funny thing that we don't know sometimes, and it'll come up again, is that investors need you more than you need them. And so that's the funniest thing, because they also need to make money. Um, and the way they make money is by finding the right businesses. So the challenge you have is that you go and you're desperate and you're, you know, they, they, they won't take you seriously. Industry focus. What do you invest in? How much do you invest? The deal size? What's your track record? Where have you invested? Who have you invested in? Do you provide any additional support? And the last thing which, which is hard to explain is chemistry. Do you like each other? Because I can tell you, when you get money from a bad person, it's just difficult. It's difficult because they will give you the worst headaches of your life. It's like if you get married to the wrong spouse, it will be a very painful life experience. And the last thing to consider is that raising money takes so much longer than you think, right? Don't waste time chasing the wrong investors. What that means is that raising money will typically take anywhere from three months to one year, one and a half years. I can tell you there's an investment I've been working on in my business. It's taken, it began in, I think I made the first presentation last year in June. We are now in September. The investment was approved, I think in May. We signed the contract in July. It's September. I don't have the money in the bank yet. So it takes time to close um, some of these investments. 
So there's some things to consider. Raising money, like I said, is an art and not a science. Raising money comes down many times to do the people like you. You know how uh, people will normally say that my friend is a bank manager. I'm going to call him and I'll get the loan. And indeed, they get the loan faster than you. They don't know, right? So build relationships. Before you go running, telling people, oh, my business is ABCD, try to build a relationship. Understand them. Understand if you click, if it makes sense. Uh, building relationships take time or takes time. So you, you have to be able to spend the time. So you meet an investor, investors or an investor, invite them for coffee. Tell them, you know what, it's okay, I'll pay. Let's have a conversation. Let them appreciate you as a person and then appreciate your business because people like to place money where they are comfortable. I like to ask a question. You imagine this, if you if your people in the in the village want you to invest in their small shop, what well, you must like them. You want to invest in your cousin you don't like, you'll invest in the one that you like. You know, it's small things like that. The best time to raise money is when you don't need it. You know, when things are going well, try to have a buffer. And that's when to go to the market, try and raise, raise money from your investors. Um, you need to know the kind of investors that you need. That's very important as well. Uh, don't take anyone's money because they offered it and don't raise more money than you need at any time. You should always know or have a clear plan around how much money you need. How investors make their decision is normally based on, you know, three things, the team, the timing, and, you know, the tenacity. So these things have to come together in terms of the business and, and how it works. So the first thing to look at is, of course, how unique is the product that you have? You know, is, is and I don't know if we have enough time, Belinda, because I, I was told 40 minutes and I look like I'm, I'm going pretty slow. Let's keep going. We okay. also have some time for questions and answers, but let's let's have this presentation out. Okay, good. All right. So yeah, so around the how unique is your product? And unique products solve problems and they solve problems for many people. Okay, that's the first thing. Uh, because if it's unique and many people have the problem, it means you're creating value for many people and it makes an attract attra it, it, it potentially will create attractive returns. Okay. How big is the market that you're talking to? So if, for example, you say that you're making, um, I don't know, border border helmets. There's so many border borders in the country, so it's exciting. But if you say that you're making helmets for children on, uh, on skateboards, you know, how many of those are actually there? So it becomes a question of how big is the potential market? And then how good is your team? I think team is one of the most important things that investors look at. Uh, when an investor meets someone and someone says, yes, I am a PhD in uh, groundnut studies and I'm going to make a company making Chipoli. It's very interesting because I feel like you know what you're saying. Maybe you have something different, you know, and, I, and I'm not saying, I know there may be people here making condiments. I'm not saying you have to have a PhD, but it's just, what is your experience? How, why you, why are you the best person to run this business? And you just need to be able to show these things, right? So it comes down to something around, you know, uh, being able to have the right team, a unique product, the big enough market, and get the timing right team and the tenacity in terms of how you, you know, push this. It makes it really exciting for investors to look at and say, okay, fine. There's something I saw yesterday around the process because it's also a, a multi-step process. We'll quickly touch that. Uh, there's also the need for you to understand who are the types of investors. You know, if this gentleman here is your uncle, uh, you probably will be able to raise money because they're what you call the business angels. Angels are family, friends, and fools. The fools are like, what are we doing? What are we doing? Let's also put, you know, where, where do we put the money? You put the money in, in uh, all these Ponzi schemes where you lose the money. But fools also can be. <laughs> can be a good way for you to raise money. If you sell your business well enough, they might be able to just, you know, jump in. Venture capital. Uh, venture capital normally typ will typically come in early in a business. So uh, you're not making revenue, but you have a good idea. Someone gives you money for a bit of the business. Uh, growth capital is also what you call similar to sort of private equity. Growth capital helps you scale and grow. Uh, private equity takes a bigger part of your business, but they give you so much more money in most cases. I think one of the, there's a company, I think, called Ascent that invested in a big mobile money uh, uh, network in the country as an example of private equity. And then lastly, capital markets, which is the stock exchange. All these are types of investors that you should understand. Of course, 
you know, you also have banks in here. So growth capital can be from a bank. It's just understanding, you know, where you are. The other thing is understanding the stages of fundraising because this is quite important, okay? So typically, and, and I know that in Uganda, we don't like to use these words, but the thing about these words is they help you define, you know, exactly at what point you are raising, okay? So the funding, first funding round is typically what you call a pre-seed round. And a pre-seed can come from angels, can come from, you know, very early stage venture capitalists. These are normally small amounts of money. So sort of, you know, 20 million to 100, 100 million, depending on the market, could be more than that, okay? This money is supposed to allow you to prove your concept. So I know maybe some of you have got those high innovator grants. So typically a high innovator grant should be like a pre-seed round to help you prove your concept. It allows you to hire the first, you know, your first customers. And it's not very big, but you need to know. So when you walk into a room and say, I'm doing a pre-seed round, it's, it's nice. People don't understand. So there's in between pre-seed and series A, there's something called the seed round. So seed rounds normally can be about 500 million shillings to maybe, you know, 3.5 billion, depending again on the business. And again, it's sort of similar to pre-seed. At that point, you're not making so much money, but you're sort of starting the business. When you start to make money, now you need to grow. And I'm not going to go to B and C, but then you typically would go for what you call a series A investment round or a subsequent investment round. And this is to grow. So now I have built my small factory with my, with my initial investments. I'm making some product, but I need to build a bigger factory because I don't have capacity to, you know, to go to my market. And later, at later investment stages, you're negotiating on the basis of, I have proven that the market exists. I have proven that they want my product, but I want to expand my business. Uh, I want to build a bigger factory, get more equipment, get more packaging, rebrand, do more marketing. You know, that's really what happens. Subsequent investment rounds really are for expansion. And, and, and at that point, you've pretty much gone into a much bigger entity. I don't want to go so much into that. You need to understand how investors invest, how they place capital. What are the instruments that they use? Okay, Because many times I hear this, this conversation. And also the unfortunate thing, we live in a country with very inexperienced investors. And I'm saying this because an investor, a good investor knows that I give you money today and I'll make my money in five years. But here people want to give you money today and ask you, can I get my money next week? Can I come and borrow money from the business? And it becomes a bit of a challenge. But if you understand the instruments that you can use, sometimes it's easier to raise money. So the first instrument is called a convertible note. When you're an early business, you, you cannot value the company. You cannot say my company is worth, I'm starting a a chili sauce business and my company is worth a billion chips. Why? You know, there's no revenue. You have no equipment. You have nothing. How can it be a billion chips? So what you do is you tell the investor, give me the, lend me the money with interest so that you actually are earning interest. And what happens is after the first one or two or three years, we shall convert that to equity at the value of the business in three years, because in three years you will have revenue. Okay. So convertible notes are very interesting instruments when you learn to use them. I've raised money on convertible notes uh, in most cases because the person knows that my money is still earning interest and at three years, I can then convert it to equity. So they're not losing money within those three years. Now, more experienced investors will do something called a simple agreement for future equity. A safe basically means that I'm giving you my money today. Uh, today is the 5th of September. Um, on the 5th of September, 2027, we shall look at the value of the business. And at that point, I will convert it to equity. Now, investors normally have what they, they're, 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 within these two instruments, there are things they put in place to allow them to be guaranteed uh, of a decent company, a decent position in the company. So there's something called a cap, a valuation cap. So because you could be very successful and I give you my 100 million and your company becomes worth 10 billion in two years. It means I'm getting like 1%. So it's, I don't really want to do that. So an investor will say something like, we shall put a cap on the investment and say, uh, or sorry, on the value. And we'll say, we'll cap it at, I'll give you 100 million today and we'll cap it at a billion shillings, which means the investor either way has 10% of your business, but they're not, they're not taking the equity now. It's going to be taken in three years. Uh, for a convertible note, uh, there's something called a can be something called a discount. So I'll say I'll take you know 20 or 30 percent discount on the valuation at the time. So if the company gets goes to 10 billion, 
I'll take, I'll get a 30% discount. So for me, it's going to be valued at 7 billion. So these things sound complicated, but when you learn them, they become very easy for you to negotiate because how do you raise money from very many of your friends? You tell them, if I want you to give me um, 10 million each, how do you, what, how do you value it? The best way to do it is a convertible note or a, or a safe agreement uh, because it sort of makes it, it makes it um, easier to get them in early. The next, of course, is equity. And equity, like I've said, someone basically says, I'm going to invest, I'll give an investment agreement that is going to give me um, um, you know, 10% of your business and it's based on the value at the time. Debt, uh, mezzanine. So debt financing really is for you know, it's banks, grants we know. Mezzanine is later stage. So later stage, and this could be structured within either debt or equity or uh, different, but this is larger amounts of money. It's nice for you to know some of these things. Some of the do's, one is prepare, okay? Make sure you have your story. The most important thing about fundraising actually is more around the story than it is, uh, is more on the story than it is around um, the business. Like I've said, it's how much do I like you? So when someone comes and says, so my wife makes chili, she makes condiments. And when she says that, so she, we grow chilies in uh, Luero with women farmers and we use those chilies to make uh, sauces. And these sauces are sold and the farmers will take their kids to school. It's just a nice heartwarming story that someone says, oh, okay, this is actually nice. But when you come and say, I have a nice business, I make money, tell a good story, have your documents in place, do your research, know the investor that you're talking to. Two, try to approach investors through introductions. Right? One of the saddest things I see, and I used to do this as well, so I know it. You walk up to someone at a conference and say, hi, my name is David, I have a nice business, I want you to invest. I don't know who you are. I don't trust you. And I like to use the example. Imagine if you go to a restaurant, if you're, you know, and a guy walks up to you and says, hi, my name is David. I want to marry you. And you're a woman. It just, you know, it doesn't, that's exactly what it sounds like. I don't know who you are. I don't, I don't know. I need to, you know, so if someone introduces you and says, oh, by the way, this is my friend, uh, talk to him. It many times becomes easier in terms of, uh, you know, being able to actually, uh, start the conversations because the investment is a conversation, right? The other thing is follow up, follow up, follow up, be engaged, be flexible. Someone says, come on at 7 p.m., go and meet them, hear what they're saying because it, it, it helps you in the process of, of, of raising money. Um, the don'ts, never seem desperate. I think the biggest thing, you know, when someone seems desperate, people run away from you. Like I've said, investments are about relationship, relationship, relationship building, okay? Many times people walk into a room and you just can feel this entrepreneur's business is struggling and it's going to die. No one wants to give money to you if your business is struggling. Seem confident, know what you're doing. Don't send unnecessary documents. I've seen people send so many documents to investors because people, they don't read them. Huh? They just look at them and say, it's, it's, I don't want to look at these documents. Send what they ask you for. Don't communicate in the wrong time zone. Now, if you're raising money from other countries, you need to know what time you know, investors are awake. Don't be intrusive and invasive. Don't be, don't, you know, don't badger. Don't, 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 it's my money, you know. So be patient as you, as you do this. The last thing is always leave some money on the table. So I've seen scenarios where someone says, I'm raising a hundred million. And someone says, I'll give you 70 and says, no, I want a hundred, right? That is going to put someone off and they probably won't continue with it. So those are just some very general themes around, um, around fundraising and what you should know about investors and how they work. Like I've said, a lot of it is really around um, how amiable are you, how much they like you, um, and how you can you know, follow up and present your, 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 your business. Should I, uh, Belinda, should I go through this? I can try to run through it quite quickly as well. Yeah, please, please I think it's quite important. Thing. Okay. Yeah. The other thing you need to be able to do, of course, is to sell yourself and sell your business. I'm sure you've done pitch sessions. I'm sure you've done these things, but I like to approach this again from my experience and, and how you know we've had to build out um, our business and, and those experiences. The thing about pitching is that you're selling yourself, right? It's how do you present your business plan to investors in a very short time so they appreciate it. And pitching doesn't secure funding for you. know What pitching does is it gets you a foot in the door such that you can start talking and try to close business. And pitching is not pitching on stage. Let's get this right. Every time you're meeting an investor, every time you're meeting a potential partner, you're pitching, you're selling to them, you're selling your proposition, right? It's basically, 
explain it so that the investor appreciates the value around it. And there are many forms of, there's many people you pitch to or people you communicate to, you know, to all the different stakeholders, investors, customers, staff, regulators, different people. And the question comes down to how do you do this? How do you present your operation? How do you present your business so people actually appreciate it? One of the ways, and I'm just going to go through this very quickly, one of the ways is really what they call the elevator pitch. And this is a short description of your company idea or product, explaining it in a way that someone can quickly understand it in a short time. Um, and the key things that you need to communicate here, are your market, how big the market is, the problem and the solution. Okay, this is the simple, like this is something you should do. Imagine you're in an elevator and you meet uh, Charles Simbire and you know I've said don't budge at people but then you start you're, you're there with, or someone says oh this is you know this is Belinda how do you very quickly tell them about okay this is who I am what I do and what the, what the company is about and the thing is these are particular things that people are looking for right? so people are looking for who who is this for where is it based what is the problem they have what do you provide them with and what is the value proposition okay so I, this was something I did with some people some time back, and it was just for fun. It was about a juice called Katanga juice for slum dwellers. And someone says, yeah, for slum dwellers in Kampala, uh, we who would like healthy drink options. You know, Katanga juice is a natural, low-cost, soft, soft drink with all the right nutrients that will quench their thirst. You know, you, you're basically able to explain who you're doing it for, where they are, what their problem is, what it is, and the value proposition. So these pretty much are the same things. And, and this is just you know, something I like to quickly run through so that you appreciate the things you need to be able to communicate in very quick statements, right? So when I started, I told you, you know, we for, you know, two operators or travel agencies or small businesses in the tourism space who need to get online and sell and acquire more customers, we provide them, um, I, oh, sorry, I said they currently struggle with the price of, of technology and what we provide them is a low cost no code solution to help them get their big companies online and sell, and they can build all these tools themselves. Right? And so you sort of want to explain it in a way that uh, you can dumb it down. Actually, the way I really explain my business is I say that we are building Shopify for tourism, and then the people who understand the technology get it, and then you know we can go back and forth in the conversation. But then the people who don't, you have to add a bit of, of, of information to it. So when you're putting together your pitch, there's this instrument tool called a pitch deck. I'm sure since you have been doing this for some time, you probably have um, a good understanding of pitch decks. But I want to go through this with you just to get um, a feel of it because it also helps you appreciate some of the things you need to do when you are structuring your, your business. Uh, sorry, your pitch or your fundraising work. So one is your company purpose, the problem you're solving, your solution, why now, the market size, competition, product, business model, and financials. Now, you don't need to have all this. It's just a few things to think about because they help you clearly explain your business to, uh, to an investor or a partner. So one is your company purpose. This is your opening slide. It's always important for you to have a presentation. I, I, I'm telling you, no matter how big you are or how small you are, always have your deck and have it ready. So when someone says, okay, talk to me about your business, pull it out, pull out your phone, whatever it is, show work. Because the visual part of showing me your business means that you're an organized entrepreneur and you know what you're doing. Right? And that's one of the fastest, that's the first thing about fundraising is how structured are you, how organized are you? Because it eventually says to me that you are a responsible person and you know what you're doing. So Define your company, first slide, very simple, one line, we're selling juice for slum dwellers, something like that, okay? Describe your problem. Um, and I'm sure you've had problem conversations over and over again. The interesting, th the interesting about problems or problem statements is that if the problem statement makes sense to the investor, they will immediately have solutions in their mind, which they base on. So I know Belinda runs uh, an apparel or, cl or clothing brand and I'm sure Belinda will say something like, you know, Ugandans don't have uh, clothing options that, what's the word, the patriotic clothing options, right? The whole world has, you know, clothes or, or, or apparel that makes them feel closer to home and connects them to home. And they just is nothing. There was nothing before Ndaba came. And someone who knows this, well, okay, this actually is true because there's, there's a gap there. So you explain your gap very well so people understand it. 
then explain your solution. So when Daba is giving is, I'm sorry, I'm going to use your business as the example as we go through this Belinda. So when Daba creates a, a branded apparel, Uganda nationalistic branded apparel that allows people to connect and stay connected to home or you know their families or things like that. What that does is it's actually touching an emotional part, okay? Now it's the same, for example, if you're doing grain, if you're producing grain, uh, I was seeing the story of, of, of Numa uh, the other day in the newspapers. And what, what he said was that there was no high quality millet uh, and maize options available in the city package because whenever you bought millet, it had stones and things like that. It immediately makes sense because what he's doing is providing a high quality millet flour that is clean and has no stones. You know, same way you see someone will argue and say, why should you buy super rice in one of these packaged bags and yet you can buy super rice from the shop? The one in the shop has stones. The one in the bags is clean. It, it's, you're basically selling efficiency. So I, tr I try to use those examples because I know some of you may be doing things like grain. So you need to explain the problem because when you explain the problem, someone appreciates the solution and then appreciates why it makes sense. You know? So why now? Why does it make sense? Because in the past, we used to have a Lusania where you put the rice and it was a family activity to clean the rice. But now families have no time anymore. There's just no time. You want to get things done quickly. There's a need for more efficiency. So it makes sense for you to just, you know, buy the rice that is clean. It's like juice. We used to have time to make the juice fresh from, and we should still do that, but we used to have time to make the juice fresh from, 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 from the fruit. But now you want to pick up something quality. So the healthier your juice can be, you're saying our juice has less additives. It's 100% pure. We don't put any chemicals in our preservation process. We, you know, things like that explain, you know, the problem, solution, and especially why it makes sense um, um, at this point. Then your market size. And I don't want to go so much into this, but it helps someone understand how big the market is. So your market size includes the universal market. So you can say our market size is, if it's the whole of Uganda, is 45 million people. But... The serviceable market is the one that is within the area you can reach. So you say, we want to cover the whole of Uganda, but for now we're in Kampala district. So we can only cover 4.5 million people. I don't know if that's still the number, but of those you're only covering, you know, you can only reach maybe people who live in Bugolobi, in Tinda, and wherever it is. What this does is it shows the investor how big the market could potentially be. It shows them what you can reach and it shows them what you can actually reach now. Okay, so it sort of creates an idea of, okay, this is how big the business is because calculating a business is like three things, literally it's the problem, does the problem exist? Uh, the solution, does it solve the problem? Yes, so you have what you call problem solution fit at that point. The next question is how big is the market? If the market is big enough, then it makes sense. And then the fourth question which should come up in a few, I think a few slides is how do you make money? Right? So your unit economics, it costs me 10 shillings to make this. I sell it for 20, I make 10. So what someone in their mind calculates is, okay, this problem is good enough, is big enough, uh, the solution is good enough. The market has a million people and this person is making 10 sh 20 shillings in sales. Uh, that means it's going to make 20 million shillings and the budget is 10%. You have an idea of how much money you're going to make. Right. So like I said before, they don't care about you, they care about money, they, but they have to like you. So the other thing you need to show them is the competition, who are the competitors that you have in your business, in the space, uh, what makes you better than the competition. If, you know, it just, it helps to appreciate that you know your market and you have an idea of what's going to happen. I'm sure the, the, the owner of uh, Chinatown, when he was presenting to his investors, said uh, our competition is the uh, downtown traders we are competitive because we have access to more suppliers in China and we are able to substantially reduce the prices, you know, something like that. And, and that makes them better than the competition. You can of course show your products or features, what makes it better, uh, your business model, your revenue model, how do you make money? What is, what are you, I'm sure you've done unit economics before, but what does it cost you to make one product, to sell the product? How much do you sell it for and how much do you make? You know, what's your pricing? How much can it grow to? How will you distribute your business? And all these things can be done in a very simple way. There are, some, there are many pitch deck resources that you can go through 
um, and be able to appreciate um, as a business. Then your team, who, who you know, who do you have on your team? Um, who is on your board? Your financials, if you have them, uh, profit and loss, your balance sheet, your cash flow, and these should be summarized. So it's literally don't put you know huge files here. Put you know small bits of information that help people understand. And then what do you want from this communication? Right. So these things pretty much help you. So you ask us how much are you raising? How much do you need? Uh, these things, this this flow helps you really package your business in a way that someone can understand it. Uh, there's a few other things you need. So something like a data room. I'll show you my data room in a second. So you actually appreciate what that looks like. But key to remember, it's your business. Uh, you know it better than the investor. Don't tell lies. What's the worst that could happen, right? Talk to as many as possible if you want to. Um, the investor probably needs you more than you need them. Uh, and I can say that at the start because investors are looking to place capital. It's how they make money. Less is more and always start with the strongest slides. If you're structuring your pitch, if your strongest thing is the team, you want to start with your team. Uh, if the strongest thing is your, your current revenue, start with your revenue. Literally walk in and say, my name is David. We make a billion shillings a year selling uh, juice to people in Kampala. I'm really interested. Right? And then after that, you start you know, going into the details of the business um, at that point. So yeah, I think I'll leave this. Um, what we can do quickly is maybe I can show you uh, what, and uh, you could advise Belinda, I could do one of two things. Either we could go to the questions or I could quickly show you the pitch for my business um, and then show you my data room. So I show you that I've done this stuff before and you appreciate exactly um, where it comes from. Okay, let's, thank you, David. Let's see if we have questions in that. So yeah, let's see if we have questions in the chat first to make sure this first part of the presentation. I personally do have some questions that I would like you to um to respond to um, before you can share more information with us. So yeah, we are speaking to David um Gonahasa. He is I, I want to call you an expert. Um <laughs> No, let me, I'm let not me an expert. Just, you're not an expert, but I what you're sharing. I have, I have a bit expert. of experience. Exactly, you're sharing very, um, very, very good information for us, and I think it will it will open up our minds to see. Okay, if we need money, where are we gonna get it from? So I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you to share your questions in the chat or put up your hand if you have a question for David. So David, I like, I've been taking notes of what you have been saying. I like the fact that you say that fundraising ends with the money in the bank, just like a sell ends with the money in the bank, fundraising ends with the money in the bank. I think we should start with that. That is, um, start with the end in mind. How do I make sure that this person gets me money in the bank as soon as possible? I also like the fact that you said that money takes on the character of where it comes from. Yeah, sometimes we get into partnerships with investors who just kill the spirit of our businesses and we find ourselves entangled and we just cannot get out of it. So money takes on the character of where it comes from. Now, you said something, David, that you need to know how much money you need. That really stayed with me. David, you have run businesses, you know. Sometimes you can even do a budget with your own money, but then you find that that budget is out of focus. So I would like you to share with us how we can know how much money we need so that we don't ask for too much and we also don't ask for too little. But we just ask for enough to help us deliver on what we would like to, to do with our investors. So please do tell us. That's a good question. Um, if you don't know your cost drivers, you don't know your business. <laughs> so you need to know your business, okay? And I understand things happen, things change, things go here, things go there. But in reality, um, one, um, if you're running a manufacturing facility, so what do you need? You need equipment, you need human capital, you need raw materials, and you need to have the calculations, okay? Yes. You need to build out a business model. And I'm sure enterprise, you kind of something you build up these financial models. It will tell you that if you do this, you'll get that. Now, the results may differ, but at least you're able to cover your cost centers over a period of time, okay? So typically what, what your advice do is raise for about 18 months, 
have about 18 months of money in the bank uh, when you're starting your business. So what does 18 months of operations look like when you look like when you go to raise money? Now, the other thing is that you probably won't get all the money from one investor because that's another thing. So I've told you 18 months of money. If you have that in mind, 18 months, if you raise for 18 months, because you know, your cost drivers, worst case scenario, it will get you to 12 months. And in 12 months, if the company is not making some revenue, clearly there's a problem there. Now, the way you can actually raise money is by doing what you call syndicating it. So you say that you want to raise a billion shillings or two billion shillings, and you're going to go to 10 different investors. But remember the valuation, I wish I had a, a, a not, a not a, what do you call it, a whiteboard, the valuation bit. So you know the company right now, we are raising uh, using convertible notes or simple arguments for future equity. We are doing a valuation cap of, let's say, you know, 10 billion. And you can go to five or 10 or 20 different investors to put money into the business. You don't need to raise from one, one person. So I can tell you the first round we raised, we raised from five investors. This next round we've done, we've raised from two investors. Actually, there will be three because there's one more coming into the deal, okay? So have a clear understanding of your cost drivers and that should give you a decent, um, a decent idea of how much you need and try to run 18 months. Now you said things happen in business. No, Belinda, things don't happen in business. Irresponsibility happens. And I've learned this, you know, we, we put the money in the wrong places. So I, 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 yesterday I, I was meeting an entrepreneur who is, you know, raising money. And you know, let me not use that story. Um, you see people doing irresponsible things. You've raised money because you have a billion shillings. You think, eh, my ring beam is not yet finished on my house. So you say, let me first take out, you know, a little bit and go and finish my ring beam. Or ha, I, how will they see me driving this old Corolla? I've just raised money. So you go and buy a, a new Subaru XV, you know? So this, this is what happens to your money. When a company has good governance structures in place and you have clarity on your cost drivers, the variance between what you raise, its ability to, to fit your needs is normally not that big. And this is the same, by the way, for a $1 million business, $10 million business, and a hundred million shillings business. If you get money to do something, do it. And if you do it well, normally the variance won't be that big if you know what your cost drivers really are. Yes, and I've also seen uh, budgets or, or pitch decks that do actually accommodate the variance. Now, David, where do we find these people? <laughs> it's a very, it's, no, this is a very good question, actually. Yes. So the investors, number one, your networks, okay? Um, your networks know people who are placing money. That's the first one. I, I went back to the thing about who are the types of investors. Angels, uh, let, me, let me open my, my thing again, because I see there's a question here, which I might have to, to take using the slides. So the types of investors, angels, family, friends. So the first one is that on the angel side, your family and your friends. If you've structured a business that's good enough, you can, the problem is normally, you know, this thing of how do you, how do you eat an elephant, right? It's in small bits and pieces. So if you want to raise 10 million shillings, don't go and ask your cousin for 10 million. No, so tell them guys, I'm raising money, but if you can invest a hundred or 200,000, there's a very good story of a company called Uganda Microfinance Limited, which was sold to Equity Bank. This gentleman, would go to his friends and his networks, ask them to invest small amounts of money. Can you invest 500,000? Can you invest 200,000? Can you invest 10, a million shillings? You know? and, and you have some sort of share cluster. So you say, you're going to raise money from many, many people. So one person may not have all this money, but many of your networks could have this money. The next is venture capitalists. Unfortunately, in Uganda, there's not very many venture capitalists, but there's a few. There's companies like Business Partners International. They're, those are really debt lenders, but they will give you up to 3.5 billion shillings as an investment. These companies like Inua Capital, who are investing money today in this market, uh, uh, Hive Collab, uh, not Hive, what do you call it? Uh, this uh, Outbox event thing, High Innovator. Okay. So the, the people are there. You just have to do the research, put the time in to find out who is investing, how much are they investing. And all this information normally is on the internet or is, it, is within your networks. When you've grown to a particular point, of course, then you have the banks, then you have you know, companies like Ascent, and these companies are in Uganda. But like I've said, 
try to get someone to introduce you to some of these companies because they know them, okay? So I'm sure Belinda has friends who, are, who invest money and she knows them. If you can become Belinda's friend, you ask Belinda, please introduce me to some of the investors that you might know. But remember, they don't owe you anything. They can introduce you, but if the investor won't invest, don't say that your friend didn't give me money. That's, that's a very Ugandan thing. So the investors exist. The point is where you start, uh, where you start is um, try to use your networks to find the investors. There's some questions in the chat which I would want to take. What yeah, does equity mean? Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. It's, yeah. yeah. Um, I just wanted to build up. I've had you echoing the point of likability, um, the point of networks, um, the point of 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 the the investor also having an interest. So I want you to weave that for the the typical Ugandan um, entrepreneur. Like I told you, the call has um, a collection of small and medium entrepreneurs. I want us to like just go a few levels below and mm -hmm. say and try to explain a situation of how we can make our businesses like it. But that's such a huge thing because it's what contributes to value. Okay. So on this on 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 this forum, we discuss uh challenges as like those, and then we decide is it something that entrepreneur can do, or can they find it to do it? And on many other occasions, we have said, okay, if the businesses cannot afford the professional, they can come together and share that service. So I would like you to talk to us about making ourselves likable. Um, making sure that we do our networking well. That bit about the branding, just speak to that before we 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 take on other questions, please. So I'm not a personal branding specialist, so I want to do a good job with that. But but I'll say this: um, investors want so a lot of it is is storytelling. Okay, mm. is how well do you tell your story um, around why it is relevant to the investor or to the market? But even before I go find that, I want to say something. Not every business is investable, right? So sometimes you just have to hustle with your business. Don't take people's money because you won't give them a return and you'll have a problem. If it's a very small business, you know, try to borrow from friends and family and, and you know, pay. if the family has no money at all and that's a problem, then, you know, look for people who can, look for angels who can come in and give you a bit of money. When you start going into structured investments, uh, uh, professionals they, they they it's not it's not a very personal process they, they you have to be amiable yes but it comes down to how good your story is um how good you can explain the problem um there's a gentleman on this group uh, he sent me a birthday greetings julius so julius i've been to his place he runs this uh homeland organics in mitiana and it's interesting because what he says is uh, he has a stop of a place where you can go and see all these fruits and things growing naturally. Right? The solution, is, what he's really solving for is when you're on the road and you're tired, instead of stopping in Movende, to, it's actually Movende, to eat the roadside meat, go to his place and have an organic meal and nice air and a nice... So what you really want to do is tell your story properly, right? What is the relevance? How does it solve problems? How do I connect to your story and what you're doing? So about the personal branding, I think just focus on storytelling and and they should come to Belinda for, for training on storytelling. <laughs> okay, let's do some some of the technical terms that you threw around. Um, please take us to that slide that has precede and and um precede and um what did I take yeah. out of it's, now it's... and proof of concept, yes. So I need you to explain the importance of proof of concept in this funding journey. Why is it so important for me one to make sure that I pass my proof of concept before I actually step into the investor, investor room? Talk to us about the whole thing of proof of concept because I think that's where the story starts, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you start making um uh, what do you call it uh, you you 
you start making claims, right? When you're starting, normally when you're telling your story, you're making claims and they could be lies or they could be true. So when you come and tell me that you have built uh, uh, a type of, of, of uh, maize meal or portion with a very high protein uh, factor, because you're adding mukene to your posho and it still tastes good, I don't believe you, okay? Mm -hmm. I will only believe it when I taste it. So mm -hmm. yes, the problem is clear. There's a problem with malnutrition um, and uh, uh, high quality balanced diets are expensive for people in, in villages. Uh, and you have made this solution, which is a one meal, which has every, it's, it's basically a balanced diet in one meal. You buy this posho and you have everything. The challenge with this assumption is that unless I can test it, I don't have the details. It's anecdotal. Okay? There's no proof to it. But when you prove it, then it works. So the, the proof of concept basically is your first version of your product. Sometimes people call it your minimum viable product to prove that one, it can give the features that you promise in your product and the market actually likes it. You've spoken to a few customers and they like it. One of the strongest things about people who raise money is that they always speak to their customers because they understand very intimately the challenges that their customers face and they're able to tell that story to the investors. So at the early stage of your business, if you're raising some money, you know, if you got that 20,000, uh, almost 80 million money from, from High Innovator, one of the most important things you want to be able to do is prove because that money may not make you grow, but it can make you prove very well that it works and then be able to access the next investors. And I want to go back slightly to your question around the, 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 uh, the, uh, the where do you find the investors? If you have gotten a grant from someone or you've gotten any money from someone, it's in their best interest to introduce to, to, introduce to the next person. So you ask them, I have proven it works. Please take me to the next investor. So that's something that you, you sort of want to do. Okay, so let's also talk about equity because we have that question in the chat. What is yeah, equity? So, um, I thought I'd explained it very well. I need to become a better teacher. Um, you Think of your company as 100%. You know, when you go and register the company, it's 100% that you own. Now, what then happens is if someone comes in and says, so so when you register your business, so normally we normally like to have, have the companies that are million shillings or 10 million shillings with your RSP. So the company is valued at 10 million shillings if you have paid up capital. So the money has been invested and you have 100% of it. So when come, someone comes and gives you 2 million shillings as an investment, they technically should take 20% of the business. So equity is where someone invests and takes a share of your business. Um, that's pretty much what it is. Now, the question that come, would come up is around how do you value a business at a, higher, at a higher value? Because the value of the business now is not what it will be in three years. And you want to raise money now. You need to raise money now. And that's where the, the notes, the instruments like the convertible notes and the safes come in because you can raise money for... You can raise money at a valuation in the future. So you take the money and say, I will take 100 million. Remember the company was set up for 10 million, but you're taking 100 million and saying that uh, we shall value the company in the future at a billion. So they still take 10% of your business, uh, you know, pretty much. So equity is when someone takes a part, gives you money to take a part of your business. But remember, if they do that, you have lost ownership. It's no longer your decisions alone. You have to report to them as well as your investors in most cases. So I have heard you say that now that we're talking about equity, we know the downside of that is that now when you start giving up equity and, and things don't go well, you might actually end up losing your business. <laughs> we have had those stories. There's one that you mentioned, and there's also another that Mr. Ochichi of Enterprise Uganda keeps on referring to the one of Vienzika, the poultry, yes. uh, the poultry gym. So now, and it happens to, it's, such, it's one of those very painful stories that it happens to enterprises that are run by families, that the communities are connected to. And it's just so hard to see that, to see that business going to foreigner. 
And I always think, David, it is our fault. What are we not doing right? Yes, we need the, the investor to come in, but where, where do we have a veil? What, what don't we look at? Are there exit yeah. clauses that we ignore? Can you talk to us about that? So investment contracts are very normally very clear documents. Always have lawyers look at your investment agreements. But I want to speak about this uh, 88 MPH uh, being Zika story. There's always two sides to these stories. Okay, So it's nice when we hear the one story where one person is saying, oh, they took my business, but you have to understand what exactly happened on the other side. Okay, And I don't know what happened on the other side. So when an investor comes in, the key thing for them is around management. Um, how well is the company being managed? How well is the company running? If the company is making money and is going fine, there is no problem. If the company is being mismanaged and you're losing incomes or revenues, is a problem. What covenants did you make as an, as, an, as an entrepreneur to take this money? So if you say that, fine, um, I'll take your investment and I will make 100 million shillings every month, but you're making 50, you've not met your side of the covenant. Okay. So be very careful when you're reviewing investment agreements for equity deals, because yes, someone can take your business. It happened to me. It actually happened to me. Someone can take your business. Uh, I see someone in the group saying private equity comes the aim of taking over the company. Private equity comes the aim of making money. This is business is not emotional. And I think one of the problems we have is we get emotional about the business. When someone comes into your business and it's not, and there's a problem with the management, they will do things to try and protect their money because they have money in there. It's not an emotional decision. It is just business. And I think that's something we need to appreciate. Um, so when you take someone's money, you need to be able to meet the commitments that you have made. And if you have it, if you're not able to make those commitments, talk uh, talk to them as much as possible in terms of negotiation. Because if you fail, they will take you. They will not take your business, but they will kick you out somehow. They they because they have to protect their money. And I can tell you, you would do the same thing as an investor because when you've put your money somewhere and it's being mismanaged. You have to be, and I'm not saying anyone mismanaged money. I'm just saying that, you know, it's just protecting their money. Now, you've had this thing of 10% uh, of, 100% uh, of, of zero is zero and 1% 1, 10, 1 of a million is whatever. Sometimes with the right investors, and remember the word I use, the right investors. And how do you know the right investors? Research, understand who they are and how they work. Understand what clauses you have to protect yourself. With the right investors, you're able to protect yourself from being kicked out. Um, so yeah, but also you just have focus on 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 you know creating the uh, the results you promised your investors. Thank you, David. So now there's that part of your presentation that you still needed to share with us. I think we have about eighteen minutes to go. Uh, oh no, I wanted to show you, and that's if you want, I can show you, um, I'll show you two things very quickly just to give you a feel of, 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 of what this looks like. So I thought I could share with you what a data room looks like, because if you're raising money, you need to have um, a data room ready. Okay. Okay, so this is this is our business data room. Okay, and we basically show this to we give our investors access to this so they can start to review it. In there, you have the business, and in the business, you have the pitch deck, you have the business plan, you have the strategy. So you know, these are things that someone goes and now they understand the business. Then you have financials. Someone can go in there and see you know different financial documents, your income statement, your financial models, so they can actually see. Okay, fine. This is what the model looks like. Here is the assumptions for the business. Here is how they're supposed to make money. Here is how this is supposed to happen and all this. Uh, in there, you have policies because policies are important. Human resource policies, IT policies, financial policies. Now, I know Trevesa is a, we've been through fundraising and all these things, but it's nice for you to organize your, your company in this way so you have these things available in case you're raising money. It just shows you organized. What are your key contracts? Uh, you have things like investor updates that you've sent in the past. So it shows that you actually share these with your, with your, with your investors. You have your different client lists. Someone can actually go to them and see how many customers you have. 
uh, ownership information, uh, and this could be different investments. It could be uh, different agreements with different customers, as you see, we've been raising on what you call safes. So someone actually sees that all the information in there is, is available, human resources, you have your staffing, you have your hiring plan, you have... So just putting this together as a business, and this is something that people pay lots of money to do, it helps you be ready for, for investment. Uh, the other thing I was saying I could do was probably take you through um, um, our, our, our pitch deck if you want to see it, but we don't probably don't need to. We can just take questions so we have a conversation. Thank you so much for that. We have a comment in the chat. Thank you, David, for this rich and relevant presentation. How do you guard against investors who just want to launder their money to your business? Yeah, <laughs> it can happen. It can happen. So that's, no, it so can happen. Just laundering, a... David, not just laundering. So we can talk about, you know how you meet somebody and you think you're going to do business, but then they have a hidden agenda. Have you Has this happened to you that, apart from the management issues that come up, and, and 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 maybe the business has to go to the investor, but have you ever had a conversation with someone who you thought had, you know, a different agenda? Yes, I have. I mean, after all these years, I've met them all. Uh, you know, someone only thinks they can loan the money through your business if your business is not well-structured. Because if it is well-structured, he knows now nah, this won't happen. And also, People want to loan the money through people who they feel they can loan the money with. You know, when someone talks to you and feels that I run a straight business that is based on integrity, they will walk away from you immediately. So just be structured, be structured, have your business well organized. Someone walks in, looks, says one, he says, no, it's fine. These guys, they won't do what I want. I think that's my best answer. Just, just uh, let them be rejected from how structured you are and how proper your governance is and, and things like that. Of course, unfortunately, if you run smaller businesses, uh, there's a, some, someone came to me one day and said, and you know, I was so I was actually hurt by this statement. I've been fighting to build a business over six years and the company was working, we're making money and it comes and says, um, I want to start doing credit card transactions through your business. I will give you, uh, I think 50%. And I can move up to five hundred thousand dollars every 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 month. So I asked him, "So whose money is this you're moving?" He says, "Don't worry about that." So you want to steal money through my business? I found it very insulting of my time and my effort. And unfortunately, we live in a country like that. So just you just reject it if you realize someone is not uh, is not uh, straightforward. Reject it. Yeah, it, it, I, I was at a, a business conference last month and someone actually made a statement and said, money follows structure or the lack of it. Yes. Yeah. So if you are structured and you have your audit accounts, you, do, you, you have your board, you have your regulatory licenses and, and, and it's the kind of structure that, you know, you're looking for an investor who, you know, also agree to that kind of structure. If you have a meeting of minds, then you will meet the right member. So as basically, everyone will get what they are looking for. I'm sure even the one who wants to loan the money is looking for a business that has loopholes. Yeah? yeah, so that they can, you know, they can take their money. So it actually depends on, on what either the investor or the business owner wants to achieve at the end of the day. Great. In the chat, Boaz Abomogisha is saying on sources of capital, you say friends, family, and folks. What do you mean by <laughs> It's a very good question. That's a very good yeah. question. There's people who will give you money without caring about it. And those are, they literally, they, they you know, there was these things. I think that was one of the most famous Ponzi schemes. I think, I forget the name. There have been many. Uh, that, that's I'm sure one. you remember some. Not the circles. There are those, those, those things. The Forex trading, whatever. And these are not bad businesses, right? But yeah. when someone comes and tells you, give me your money, I'll give you 100% per week. They're lying. You're a fool to give them your money. And yeah, fools do invest. They, 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 they make, they give cash in areas where they really shouldn't. So the fools are here because, yeah, you could actually raise money from people who don't even know what's going on. 
Yes. So maybe as we come to, okay, we have about 10 minutes, David. Can you share with us, okay, apart from you, professionals, that we can go to, okay, first of all, we should come to you. <laughs> that is if something that you can do for us. Um, you will tell us if that is true, but are there professionals in Uganda that um, we can go to in case we need to prepare our documents, look through our investor licenses, make sure that all the dots and I's are, are crossed. Do you know of any people? So there's a number of companies that do this kind of investor readiness thing. I'm sure even Enterprise Uganda does this work. I'd be I'd be surprised if you don't. But there's a number of entities that that provide this kind of uh, of of support. I think Bid Network is one of them. Um, which other ones? Unfortunately, have, we've had to do this uh, just you know very uh, very very the the hard way. But what, what we can do is I can share my contacts and then on a case by case basis, if anyone wants to reach out on WhatsApp, I can try and uh, see if I can put you in touch with some people. Like I've said, we, we basically did this the hard way. So my number is in the chat. And your and email, address. email address as well. So in case you want to, um, oops, that's not my, that's my number. And this is my email address. And yeah, I can I can you know try to put you in touch with some people from time to time. Oh, that's not my number. The number is wrong. Two nine five six four. Okay, we need to delete the other one. Someone might pick it uh by mistake. Great, David. As you do that, please prepare to give us your parting shot. Pardon? I missed that. Please uh, give us your parting shot. Yeah, no, I think someone just put something around business of being emotional. I think that's it. It's, it's not an emotional journey. It's a very structured journey that you have to walk. To this day, I still struggle with some of some things. I mean, I, I've had uh, many horror stories, but I think, you know, as long as you have grit and tenacity and you keep pushing through you know, you can succeed, uh, you can succeed at raising money, you can succeed at building a business, you can succeed at solving problems. Also, I think, you know, really focus on solving problems in your community. And if you do this well enough, you'd be surprised at how successful uh, you can be. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much for sharing your insights this Thursday morning. Um, I've picked quite a number of pointers about us making ourselves likable, about us uh, learning what solutions we actually give, uh, our businesses give. Yeah, we need to understand what the problem is, what the solution is, and which market we serve and how big that market is. We need to remember that fundraising ends with money in the bank. We need to always ask ourselves, what is the investor looking for or what could this friend want from my business okay and then we need to pick our investors carefully money takes on the character of where it is coming from we also need to do a bit of research on our investors i have had stories of a certain investor who who i don't want to give that story <laughs> yeah david has shared with us how we need to know how much money we need. We've learned what proof of concept is, what equity is, and other investor terms. And I hope that helps us plant a seed on what we could use to start on the journey of looking for money for our businesses. And I think it's inevitable that once you start doing a business that is um, solving quite a number of problems in the community at one point, you will need to go and either borrow money from the bank, get an investor, or get some equity uh, financing, or even get some venture capitalists investing into your business. But you have to know how to do it. Oh, he's also shared and said, there are professionals that can help us do this thing. Don't do this thing alone. If you don't know how to tell stories, find someone who can help you. And while we are doing all these things, we need to learn to do our networking, and also build our relationships, and most importantly, share this information with the next generation. I want to thank you so much, David, for your time this morning. Everyone is appreciating you in the chat. We wish you the very best with uh, Teresa. Um, we, we will tell our friends to come to you. 
<laughs> now that we know what we are what you're doing you. uh, from enterprise uganda i want to thank you all for tuning in this morning and yeah it's just the 5th of september yeah we usually uh find out if it's the end of the month or okay, we are paying taxes no we are still in the better part of the month i think we paid our rent and also paid our <laughs> salary so we are now just starting to breathe yeah so until the next our business recovery series um i want to wish you a great thursday and good luck with your journey to finding investors for your businesses bye good morning